Uh, let me uh, remind uh, every one of ourselves here uh, to take a moment and cultivate uh, the highest uh, form of motivation. Uh, we call it uh, bodhicitta motivation called the altruistic motivation, seeking complete enlightenment for the benefit of all other sentient beings. And with that kind of motivation, uh, we should all participate uh, in this uh, lumbering discourse of the teaching, teaching on the stages of path leading to enlightenment by Manjushri Lama Tsongkhapa. Allow me to read about uh, a page or two uh, from this great uh, Lamrim text, uh, volume number three in the English translation of uh, uh, Lamrim Shemo. And uh, I was told we are somewhere in page 182. Uh, uh, to give you the blessing of oral transmission first, uh, followed by uh, explanation. <laughs>
Tobinano, Jugalitemura Jimmy, Nambrajobe <laughs> Zindangi <laughs> Tanyi Tanya 
Just to make sure <laughs> that I'm not confused, <laughs> and then you will be confused. <laughs> um, so actually, I read uh, from the bottom of page 180 uh, to 183 uh, to give us uh, the blessing uh, of oral transmission of Sublim uh, <coughs> Chemo. And now he started to uh, give explanation here. Um, just to uh, recapitulate uh, where we left off uh, in the footnote, that was quite some time ago, <laughs> um, is, uh, you know, we were dealing with uh, uh, refuting uh, objects of negation, or in Tibetan called gaksha, what needs to be refuted or negated. And uh, relating to that, uh, we, uh, you know, highlighted uh, two types of, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, difficulties we encounter here. And number one is um, uh, if uh, we uh, refute too much, uh, that is called uh, a very overly broad, uh, you know, refutation, uh, which is really usually considered as uh, more of, a, uh, how should I say, uh, problems that we should attend to in terms of negating the object of negation. The other one is not negating enough, right? We call it a very narrowed, uh, um, you know, negation of uh, negation, uh, which usually deals with uh, what kind of things are asserted in the lower schools of uh, Buddhist schools of thought, because each of them are refuting something, but it's not good enough, so to speak, right? Uh, so we pay usually more attention to refuting too much, you know, uh, uh, and, um, and then uh, relating to those, uh, we talked about according to Prasangika uh, Madhimika school of thought, the highest uh, Buddhist school of thought as we usually uh, call it, uh, uh, how do they assert that something exists conventionally, right? Something is conventionally existent, right? Because Prasangika accept that things are not completely non-existent, right? Things do exist. So they said it exists conventionally or nominally, right? Kunzo of the yoga in Tibetan. And uh, so they uh, tested in terms of three sort of criteria. Number one is Tanya um, Semal uh, something that is known uh, to a valid cognition, right? Uh, uh, to say that something exists, it must be known to some valid cognition, right? That's uh, part of the criteria. The another one is that its existence must not be uh, invalidated by some other valid cognition, uh, uh, some other conventional valid cognition. Okay? And then, then the third uh, criteria of the test is that its existence should even not be uh, refuted by the rational analysis, the ultimate kind of analysis. Right? So those are the three criteria uh, we use uh, uh, to uh, determine whether something exists conventionally or not, right? Something has to be known to a conventional valid cognition, and that its existence must not be invalidated by some other valid conventional cognition, and that its existence must not even be invalidated by or undermined by rational analysis, right? Ultimate kind of analysis. So that's the test, right? So that, those are the things we highlighted before, and that's where we left off, and now we're going to continue our uh, conversation here. Oh, <laughs> 
Um, so before I translate what Gisela has uh, very profoundly and beautifully explained, uh, just a footnote uh, for the people who are very new here today, uh, that uh, uh, we are uh, in the later section of uh, the great Lumbering Chemo, the great treatise on the state of path enlightenment, uh, which deals with uh, special insight or vipassana into the ultimate nature of things. So this is where we are cracking our you know, skulls here. It's a very tough, difficult subject. And if you just walked into this, uh, we might completely confuse you, right? We <laughs> footnote. So you have to bear with us. So we are in a very different section in Lamrim Chemo. Uh, so that's that. Now I'm out of my footnoting here. Uh, I'm going to translate what Geshe said. said. Um, according to Prasengiga Madhimika School, highest Buddhist school of thought, uh, everything is merely imputed by terms and concept. Okay? Uh, that is their claim. Nothing exists intrinsically in and of itself. Everything is merely labeled. Okay? That is uh, uh, how uh, uh, things exist. And um, so when we um, um, engage in what is called rational analysis, tucked in Teva, right? It is uh, absolutely essential for us to have precise idea of what is the object of negation or refutation. What is being negated or refuted? With that clear image of what is being refuted in our mind, then we engage in the rational analysis of things, whether or not things exist in that particular mode. Okay? So under such analysis, nothing becomes findable. Okay? But that does not mean nothing exists at all. Are you with me? So that's a big uh, claim of the Prasangika Madhimigas. Now, critics are charging, so to speak, uh, Prasangikas, that you are nihilist. You know, your claim entails that nothing exists at all. Okay? The problem you know, we encounter here in this debate is the critics have not identified clearly the object of negation. Okay? And uh, so they thought that if something exists, it must be findable under rational analysis. If something is not findable under rational analysis, then the conclusion is it does not exist, right? And President Giga said nothing is findable under rational analysis, right? Therefore, they said, well, you goofed, you see? Now nothing exists at all, you know? And President Giga are saying, like, you know what? You're really not listening and understanding our point. You can only do rational analysis. First, you have to make sure, right, what is uh, the object of negation. And if you don't have any clue about that, and then you engage in some kind of analysis, you're goofing around, you know, you really don't getting it at all, okay? And according to Pasengika Madhimigans, things exist conventionally, and we do not put that under rational analysis to say that things exist conventionally, okay? And we do not have to assert you know, for the things to exist conventionally, it must be findable under rational analysis. As a matter of fact, it's not findable, okay? So that's the big, uh, how should I say, the um, positional differences between the critics and the person giga mademikans, okay? So we have to really make sure about that, otherwise we get really uh, confused uh, what's being uh, said here. And uh, so this is what the critics are starting to hear, person giga saying, which they are not. They think like, oh, so you are saying that uh, 
you know, if you talk about a guy called Hua Zhejin, well, that's a Tibetan name. Let's make it a John, right, by consensus, you know. So John. Well, who is a John? Okay, is the John his head or his arms, his nose, anybody's body? Well, nobody's going to say that's a John, right? John is not going to be his nose, right? It's not, neither is going to be his eyes, ears, whatever, right? So at the end of the day, when we split up, right, the John, every part of his body, there is no John, okay? And so they say, you know, so now does that mean John doesn't exist? Right, that's the critics claim. Under that analysis, we don't find John, right? John is neither any part of his body, so therefore John does not stand there. So they said, look, you know, so, that, so you are saying that John doesn't exist. But Prasangika is saying, no, John is a conventionally existent, so we don't put the John under analysis like that, you know? Nobody says, like, is John the ear or the eye or the nose or, you know, I mean, who says that? What we are saying is that there is no intrinsic John, right? Intrinsically existent John. So you have to make sure of that clarity of that, you know, object of negation. So once you are clear of that image, now you try to analyze whether John exists intrinsically as a single phenomenon, one entity, or John intrinsically exists as a multiple phenomena or different, or is John any part of his body, psychosomatic aggregates? He isn't. So under that analysis, we don't find John to exist intrinsically at all. So that unfindability tells us that John does not exist intrinsically. It's just a mere label onto right, John's psychosomatic aggregates. You know, that's the person giga's point. But the critics are still not hearing that. They're saying, like, you know what? Uh, what you're saying is, you know, uh, if we say John in general, the name, right, is that person his eye, nose, hair, tongue, whatever, and he isn't, and then you're saying like, well, now John exists at all. Yeah. So there's that positional differences between the critics and uh, the person giga Mademiga school. Well, now I hope I translated as clearly as I could, or we will come back. <laughs> <laughs> In <laughs> so we are uh, on the, uh, towards the bottom page 118. Uh, so refreshing our mind here. According to Pasengigas, for something to exist conventionally, you know, we test it in terms of, so to speak, three criteria. Number one, uh, that means something known to conventional uh, cognition, okay, not the valid, so conventional cognition. And that is existence is not invalidated by any other conventional valid cognition now. Okay? And that its existence is even not nullified or invalidated by uh, the rational analysis. Okay? Uh, so in that context of framework, so what we say, uh, person Gika is saying that if something is known to conventional cognition, that alone does not necessarily mean that something has to exist conventionally, right? That things could be known to conventional cognition or consciousness, but they may not exist at all. Yeah? And the example given here is, for instance, for our conventional uh, consciousness, you know, we, uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, what is known is that, for example, mountains and, uh, you know, some of these, uh, like, concrete things, as if they exist permanently, isn't it? We said, well, well this has existed for so long time, I mean, for thousands of years, right? But in reality, you know, 
these great mountains are undergoing momentary disintegration, changes, right? But that's not known to the conventional cognition. For us, it's not like, well, well this is existing from my grandparents' time, and this still is existing. Looks like it's permanent, right? It's known, but in reality, these mountains and rocks don't exist permanently, right? They have been undergoing momentary changes or disintegration, and someday they will collapse, you know? Uh, so therefore, just because something is known uh, to a conventional consciousness is not a sufficient enough condition to say that something exists conventionally. Okay, there are other conditions need to be met. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. メゴバメゴラランゴトバヨガバジョワソマンラスダティティレンディレガジェカルサカジゲネチュモヨエネチアジョワダチュモヨヨヨヨヨヨヨヨヨヨヨヨヨヨヨヨヨヨヨヨ
so that's what they said. There is a difference between philosophical differences and something existing for a habituated mind. Uh, uh, that's a two different things. So what we are saying is that if something ha exists for a habituated conception of a mind, then that thing must exist. And now President Gigas are responding to that part of the like argument. They said, you know what? Uh, well, then we run into this other problem. You know, uh, in terms of habits, we the ordinary sentient beings have the habit of uh, seeing everything as intrinsically existent, isn't it? And we are never used to seeing things non-intrinsically. You know, we are so happy to seeing that everything exists, you know, from their side, in and of themselves. So that's our habit. But we person gigas don't accept that things exist intrinsically. We have been saying all along that things are just like uh, um, a, a magical illusion, isn't it? Illusory. I think are just like the dream state, right? So we use these examples to prove our point that nothing exists intrinsically. Now, if we go with your argument, then we have to accept that things exist intrinsically. That's exactly how it appears to our habituated, you know, <laughs> uh, perception, innately developed habituated perception. Uh, but that doesn't, again, right, uh, abstent uh, uh, true. So that's the argument going back and forth. Uh, <laughs> Ronaldo <laughs> 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 So we're on top of page 181. To, uh, we have a passage quoted from uh, Arya Nagarjuna, uh, you know, Chandrakriti's commentary on Arya Nagarjuna's uh, six, uh, 60 stanzas of reasoning. Yeah, so Geshe-la is explanation, explaining that passage. And this passage is cited uh, uh, you know, uh, by the person to tell the critics that if you argue that just because things are known for innately developed, habituated uh, cognition or conception, things must exist, uh, it doesn't work that way. Yeah? And um, so according to the explanation given on this passage is when we look uh, at uh, uh, the truth of suffering, of the Four Noble Truths, or right? Dukkha, right? And uh, so what is known to our habituated uh, you know, perception is uh, uh, that uh, you know, suffering is permanent, okay? Uh, that, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 what is it? Uh, suffering is kind of pleasurable or blissful, I don't know, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, that uh, you know, suffering is maybe in some pure state, in some sense, there's a purity. And uh, then there is, uh, you know, uh, suffering has intrinsic quality, self. Isn't it? So these are the things, attributes known to us, our habituated, innately developed conception about uh, uh, the nature of suffering. But in reality, suffering is just the opposite of all of those things, right? We talk about how, uh, you know, um, 
when we talk about the four attributes of the truth of suffering, uh, midaba, suffering is impermanent. It's not permanent. Okay, that's the reality. Right? So our habit grouped on this one. Okay? And um, uh, uh, suffering is misery. So it is not blissful or like, ha ha ha. You know, it, it, it is a problem. Okay? Uh, suffering is dhameva. Uh, it is selfless, existent. You know, it doesn't have atma or self. Yeah? And suffering is empty, isn't it? So in reality, that's what the suffering is. But from our habituated point of view, suffering is just the opposite of all that. Suffering. So therefore, our habit is not a trustworthy, isn't it? You know, so, uh, that's what we're telling the critics. You know, if we go with our innately developed habit, uh, habituated perception, you know, it's not you know really reliable. You know. What is that? That is the currency of the currency. So this passage from Chandakiti's commentary on the strict stanzas really, I mean, make it clear that if we go by our innately developed, habituated perception, there is a problem here. You know, we see the things in the way they don't really exist at all. <laughs> the qualities they don't have, but we think suffering is permanent, suffering is blissful, you know, suffering is self-existent, but in reality, the suffering is none of those things, you know. Mm-hmm. The <laughs> だ、<laughs> so it is one, two, three. Uh, the fourth paragraph on page 181, um, where the paragraph begins with this sentence. Thus, a conceptual consciousness which apprehends the aggregates as impermanent and so forth is mistaken with regard to its appearing object and so on. Okay? And so Keshila has uh, you know, uh, offered ex- uh, explanation on the, what is contained in that particular paragraph. Um, we have to know the difference uh, between conceptual cognitions and the non-conceptual uh, you know, sensory uh, perceptions. Yeah. Conceptual cognitions, we call talkba in Tibetan, you know, uh, they, 
there is a certain element of what they are mistaken too. Uh, they are always mistaken with regards to their appearing objects. We call nang yu. Okay? But they may not be mistaken with regards to the actual objects or the reference object. They may perceive the actual objects correctly, but they are mistaken with regard to the appearance of, right? Or the appearing object. Do you see that? So that's about the conceptual cognitions. We call it thokpa. They are mistaken to the appearing object, but they may not be mistaken to the uh, actual objects they're dealing with. Are you clear with that? Non-conceptual non -conceptual sensory perceptions. Okay. Uh, if they are mistaken with regard to the certain aspect of the object, it's more likely that it's mistaken with regard to other aspects of the object. Okay. And uh, in the case of, um, uh, let's say, uh, the, the, with regard to the conceptual cognition, there is a con uh, uh, conceptual valid cognition of impermanence, right? This conceptual cognition, it understands or perceives the impermanence correctly. It's not mistaken towards that. But it's mistaken with regard to you know, how uh, the appearing object here also. Okay. In the case of uh, non-conceptual sensory perceptions, we call it wang chi, right? Uh, in one sense, uh, these are all mistaken perceptions, the sensory. Uh, according to Pasangigas, because uh, things are appearing uh, to these perceptions as truly existent or intrinsically existent, so therefore it's mistaken, right? Uh, but uh, in another sense, uh, we have to make a two categories of uh, uh, mistaken uh, perceptions within sensory perceptions, okay? Maybe I'm just saying it too many words here jumbled. Uh, let me uh, try to separate them. Uh, one is we call, for lack of a better word in English, at least from my point of view, uh, there is a lokpe kunzop. I always found it difficult to, to translate this. I call it, you know, a lokpe kunzop is a false conventional uh, uh, conventionality, literally translating it. Yeah? And uh, so in this kind of a sensory mistaken perceptions, we include things like, um, uh, things like, um, um, you know, seeing double visions of the moon, Right? If you're seeing two moons, that's a problem. That's only one moon. Okay? <laughs> uh, so that is uh, like a sensory perception that's mistaken. It's getting a double vision of the moon, isn't it? Okay? Or that uh, you know, uh, when we are at the magic show, right, uh, we see the magical horses as real horses and elephants, but it is not. Right? So these are sensory uh, perceptions which are mistaken in nature. These are called false conventionality. The log of, and this, they're really they, they're really gone wrong here, right? But then there's other category of sensory perceptions which are mistaken in some sense. Um, but uh, uh, let me see. Yang da kunzo, okay, yang da kunzo ki pe lo karshan ba. Yang da do do de kang zo de ong yi tong du kang ga shou kong ba ga wa zing kang ga ong yi tong du de kang ga. Uh, so these are the, uh, in some sense, uh, let's say we have a visual valid cognition that's perceiving a form, right? And it is valid. It's cognizing the form correctly, but at the same time, we call it uh, a conventionality. It's called the correct conventionality or yang tak kunzo because yang tak slab kwa ite kajabu. Yang tak se ite ta dele yang tak bachu ba sinu kuna nongzu nangshin da buju yewan zimba. ยังตาสิยังตาบ่สิตะท้องตะบ่จะบ่ชิบ่ร่วะบ่ติตะจีเดรังกาวเฉดิตะคาร์ซินเมลุนนังชียิสุญเยติกุนชีชิมายบ
That's called false conventionality, log by Kuhn's law. See that? But we can figure it out. But for us ordinary beings, the way we perceive uh, form, sound, everything validly, there's some kind of, uh, how should I say, uh, external, externality of these objects, right? But we don't see, they don't exist in the way they appear to us. We just kind of go with it, isn't it? So that's called the correct conventionality, right? Because nobody figured out, like, yeah, that appears to me in that way, but it really doesn't. We don't. Usually we think like, okay, there's you, there's me, right? Just the way you're seeing me and I'm seeing you, there's some kind of truth of the matter. There's some existentiality. I don't question, well, Latmir is over there. I'm over here. That's it. This is called, this kind of a sensory uh, valid cognition is what called the correct uh, conventionality or the Yangtze Kunzo. Okay. So our conventional experience point of view, so we find that difference. When we're looking uh, you know, uh, in the mirror, we can easily figure out it's just my reflection, it's not a real thing. The moon is reflected in the water, the moon is up there, not in the water down there, right? We can figure it out. That is the kind of conventionality, we call it false conventionality or lokvekunzo, okay, falsity here. But in our own ordinary experience, all the things we experience validly, right, the sounds and the smell and the vision, we just go with it, right? It looks like there's something there, isn't it? We are not saying that things exist just the way we think it is there, but there's some kind of thing, right? We don't figure out how the things are appearing to us in one way and existing in another way, right? Generally, we don't talk about the disparity between how they exist and how they appear to exist. We just go along with it. You exist there, I exist there. You hear me, I hear you. I see you, you see, you know. There's no other things going on here, right? That is called the, uh, the for lack of a better word, correct conventionality, okay? Yang Zhao Kun so for us as ordinary people, things appear to our, us as intrinsically existent and truly existent, but we don't know that usually, isn't it? But we just believe in that, right? We don't, you know, we are not like, oh yeah, they're appearing in this way, but they really don't exist. We don't differentiate that. We just, you know, Go along with how things are appearing to us, you know, and just we go about with our life. So that's what we call, it's not mistaken from our point of view. We don't realize the mistakenness here. We just think this is the truth of the matter, you know. Uh, so that's what we call Yang Dao Kun Zhou, called the correct conventionality. <laughs> Tonto you mean like Jordan in Samuel Joe, she songs also that team that Conde Tamidaso did there was a talk, doing it up and doing it, there was here and then doing it out, but doing it in it. So she teach you what the tiny demands are tiny to go to war is. That doing it metaba, doing it on a dame was a teach you she would be in a tiny deal that repair got to my days. That does a doing it up, said that doing it there was a little gazette of Jago Marwa. Tangle 
in the Tazo Hitty Yamaris, in the Dumas of Hitty Yardis, or did it or did it? So now Kishala is giving explanation on what uh, you find in the last paragraph at the bottom of page 181. Um, with regard to, for example, uh, truth of suffering, um, we can talk about its four attributes, uh, the opposites of it. Uh, you know, uh, let's have been say that uh, the, f um, the four misconceptions with regard to the attributes of the truth of suffering is that uh, uh, suffering is uh, permanent, okay, and suffering is blissful, uh, and suffering is uh, has a self-existence, and suffering is, uh, in some sense, we call suffering includes other things, okay, and it's, it's weird to say in English suffering is pure, you know, I know that, but I have to say it, <laughs> uh, the technical term here. Um, so these false attributes of the suffering, misconception, they even don't exist conventionally, isn't it? We don't have to say, like, you know, but, well, suffering is not, uh, does not exist you know, intrinsically as permanent. Suffering does not exist intrinsically as blissful, right? We don't have to use the intrinsic uh, uh, here attribute. We just simply, right, we can say, you know what? Suffering is not permanent. Suffering is not blissful, right? That's how it exists. But in the case of the actual attributes of the truth of suffering, where we say suffering is impermanent, yeah, mida, Suffering is misery, uh, suffering is selfless, suffering is empty. Yeah. So in this case, right, we might have to use uh, the, uh, the, uh, the qualifying term, suffering does not intrinsically exist as impermanent. Suffering does not intrinsically exist as uh, misery. Suffering does not exist intrinsically as selfless. Suffering does not exist intrinsically as empty, see that? The qualifying term is very important, right, to talk about these four you know, attributes, let's call it positive attributes of the truth of suffering. But when we talk about the negative attributes, well, that may be my new term today, right, <laughs> of the truth of the suffering, that suffering is permanent, suffering is blissful, suffering is, you know, has self, suffering is uh, well, whatever, uh, we don't need to use the qualifying term intrinsic existence, are you with me? Uh, if we use intrinsic existence in terms of all these qualifications, then we cannot differentiate between the negative attributes and the positive attributes. Looks like everything doesn't exist at all. You know, that's the problem. I know we are getting hard on ourselves, but hey, welcome aboard. So. What did you say? That told them you came to Jana. In the talk about the meta, but you got me up a chick by it. I don't know that he did all your so. So that was in some of you, so that was in some of you, the Thomas and some of you say, Ganga Samal, you say, I'm over here, Mare. No, this is not the garrison. This is Gaja Chaval Jana. In the Taval Jews and the Zemel Hero, so Mutavas did not Samal Jigur, some of the Chinjuloro. No, so. And so Tavas did not Samal, Tavas the Mayor to go at the Samal Jews, Mutavas in the way to the Samal Jew, Mara, Yanta on the Enroa. Did you not eat those who are the carriers and Gaja Chaval Jaro on the Gaja Chaval Jana? In the Tava Meta, Yinka, you may have a Yayoma, a remote to what is all. In the Dolby, did a Kersa, Samal Jesia, so Metava, and Samal Jesia, the Gaja Chevel Janish tea on the series, you know. The Telegon, Sukta Meta, Dungu, you may come as John Samal Jeva, some sort of cigarette, Dolly, Kijin. So that's why to make that distinction in the Sutra. So we find uh, statements where they use qualifying term, you know, intrinsic existence with regard to, uh, like say, the forms are uh, impermanent, right? But they are not intrinsically impermanent. They don't exist intrinsically as impermanent and so forth. So that's a very important qualifying term, right? And we must understand why in the sutras, in that qualifying term is used to talk about, right? Uh, that uh, uh, the forms are impermanent and uh, I mean, so forth. Uh, but when we talk about the negative attributes of the Four Noble Truths, we do not need to use the qualifying term. But if we do that, then we are, um, how should I say, then we won't be able to differentiate between uh, what is actually existent and what is not, right? Suffering does not exist conventionally as permanent. Suffering doesn't exist conventionally as blissful. We don't have this. I mean, use a qualifying term here at all, right? Just, it doesn't exist. Uh, whereas when we talk about suffering as impermanent, suffering as empty, we have to use the qualifying term that suffering does not exist intrinsic. Suffering is impermanent, 
but it is not intrinsically impermanent. Suffering is empty, but right, but it doesn't exist intrinsically as being empty. See that? Oh, Kajingando ที่เต็มมาเรบะที่เอ็นกว่ากุนโซที่มอเชกเวนเอ็นเต็มมาเรบะที่ลอกฮีเรเดอร์บาสตะคูงอลเยนี่ยบะชูมาบาลาเรโ
as Kishore will try to explain it. Um, so dangerous, dangerous. Right. So, that is the test of the dangerous. 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 So, that is the test ที่คนอยู่ในเดิมมาเดิมว่าอยู่ในปีสามเบี้ยงอยู่ <laughs> So when we talk about the true truths, conventional truths, some virtus satya, kunja of in Tibetan, and ultimate truth or paramatha satya of dhyantam in Demba, these two truths are posited from different perspectives, angles. Okay, number one. Ultimate reality or the truth, paramatha satya is posited from the perspective of a transcendental being's wisdom, right? Emptiness is considered as a truth, it's not truth. You know, truth from the point of view of those who have, you know, non-conceptually realized what it is, the ultimate nature. So f in terms of their wisdom, it is the truth. Okay, are you with me? Conventional reality of the truth is posited from the perspective of our conventional, uh, conventional uh, how should I say, perception. So they are simply truth for our ignorant conception, but in reality they are not the truth. So, that, so therefore, it's a, it is a, what we call concealer. The concealer means our conception, uh, which is uh, influenced by the ignorance. It, it is as if it, it obscures the reality, but at least for us, right? If we say, do you believe in it? Yes, that's the truth for me. So from our ordinary conventional point of view, conventional truth is a truth, but in reality, it's not a truth. Do you see that, you know, the, the difference? Okay. ODDSR <laughs> ยวายินจิกดินซิปองซังกิตุกอลเลเอนิคองโมเดมเบเดนซะติชากุมาริสเอนิตาจันเดเปเซติซาเยวาเตตุเดคุนโซซัมเรมาคิจิคุนโซเ
Lohiti, talk about number and job by member Shen also, that petty a conje. That the good of the embassy, the embassy, the dancing was shagged, the china, so tell us about so you are the dancing was shagged my race. That she did a lot. He petty got the better. Talk about the Lohiti, Mona Tabaco, really the Yorwa. In a tea, talk about doing the Lord Lohiti, Lohi, Medical Coro Hago Marva, Coro, do this something or Medical. So in the last uh, paragraph on page 182, um, there is an example given to illustrate the point. Um, how conventional truth is a truth for the conventional uh, uh, perceptions, but it's not the truth for the transcendental wisdom. Okay? Because the transcendental wisdom can differentiate the disparity between how things appear and how things exist. But our conventional uh, perception doesn't, doesn't do that. You know, and the example given is that of a uh, uh, mistake, uh, mistaken uh, perception of a coiled rope as a snake, right? So if you know we mistakenly perceive there's a snake in that corner because it looks like a snake, like some coiled stuff, right? At least for that mistaken perception, that is a snake, isn't it? That's the truth. In, right, that's the truth. For our mistaken perception that is seeing snake over there because we're just freaking out. Because that appears as real snake, and we believe that is the snake, right? So the conventional reality is almost like that. We posited it from a conventional experience point of view, right? The ignorant perception. But somebody who can differentiate, hey, that's not a snake. That just looks like a snake. It's a fake snake, right? So that's like a transcendental wisdom. They say, you know what? You know, what you are perceiving is not the truth, you know, but at least for yourself, for your perception, it's a truth because you are freaking out. You know, you think there's a snake, right? So that's how uh, the uh, you know, difference between conventional truth and ultimate uh, truth. So we will stop there uh, uh, today and we welcome your questions, observations, and clarifications we need to offer or I need to offer as a translator. I don't know. Hello? Sure. Uh, where is the, yeah, go ahead. Maybe let me and I'll just insist you start, then somebody will follow. Yes, you know. Well, actually, yeah. a few clarifications are needed. Uh, about the, it was mentioned many times that suffering is pure, uh, permanent, blissful, and then right. non self and, and uh, non empty. But, but here it seems they're talking about uh, the aggregates. So it, it kind of doesn't make sense to call suffering as blissful or to be perceived even conventionally as blissful. Mm -hmm. The aggregates could be. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Oh, more I see. Yeah. Better okay. to say the aggregates are <coughs> suffering. Right. Yeah. Alors, Korang, this is what I'm going to say. Korang, again, say, 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 だんだんがとみさんはじゃいんでかるぷんぷみさんはじゃくどわけ。じゃじゃこのぷんぷみさんはなんてぶるしょわけ。とんげみさんはラブでなんやんけんざるしょわけ。わでてせせしなるなす
So the reason I was trying to get clarification is, you know, um, um, because there's some stuff that even need to be clarified in my mind before I can translate to you. Um, so Geshe-la says, yes, you know, I mean, usually when we talk about vulnerable truths, for each of the truths, we talk about uh, four attributes. So we talk about 16 attributes, right? So we're simply using uh, the suffering as just a case in example, right? We talk about four attributes. And uh, so you're right, in, in general, when we're suffering, it seems so abstract, right? When you say suffering is pure, it doesn't start to make any sense. Uh, but in the text, the example uh, that we use is our, uh, uh, our aggregates, our sagandhas. So sagandhas are in the nature of suffering. So, so you know, so we per misperceive uh, aggregates as permanent, although it's impermanent. And, uh, you know, we misperceive aggregates as having self, although it is selfless. And we misperceive aggregates as, uh, you know, um, I should say, being pure. That's why I was asking a lot of questions. Uh, this purity has nothing to do with impurities in our aggregates. That's what Gisela was trying to explain, you know, because usually similarly, you know what, our body has a lot of yucky stuff, right? We're not talking about that, impurities here. This pure, the, the Tsangba, you know, it actually is explained in terms of uh, misperceiving the aggregates as, uh, uh, like, as serving the purpose of self-sufficient, substantially, you know, existent uh, honor or a person, see that? So that is explained as purity. You know, when we misperceive the aggregates as, you know, performing functions to serve the needs of a self-sufficient I, which there isn't. So that is called the purity, not the impurities, you know, yucky stuff that, you know, uh, you, sometimes we talk about. And uh, so, so that way it's easier to understand, you know, how I mean, aggregates are, you know, not permanent and they're not, you know, pure in that sense, okay? Yeah. Next. <laughs> Uh, so the explanation Geshe gave about what it means uh, misperceiving aggregate as being pure, uh, that explanation is really, you know, often it's not really uh, uh, elaborate that much, but it's found in the auto commentary of uh, Treasure of Knowledge uh, by Vasubandhu, you know, where it's explained. Uh, so this refers to almost like, and it's kind of related to grasping at mind. You know, we talk about grasping at eye and grasping at mind, right? And so uh, grasping at mind includes, you know, misperceiving the aggregates as fulfilling, you know, some purpose for self-sufficient I or the self, you know.
Okay, next question, anybody? Yes, uh, could you give, uh, could you use the mic? Uh, Sure, sure. Okay. Sure. Um, if you're going to on the five heaps, mm -hmm. um, the last of the five heaps would be consciousness. Mm -hmm. When you get to consciousness um, and you begin to do analysis on the consciousness, how do you mm -hmm. identify mm -hmm. the object of negation, of negation the gakcha, mm -hmm. um, of consciousness? Because mind has no shape, no color. Mm -hmm. No form and is categorized as mm -hmm. that which is aware. Right. So, mm -hmm. how do you identify mm -hmm. that which is aware sure. so that you can perform analysis on it mm -hmm. to sure. then arrive at right. a conceptually designated realization of sure. emptiness or mm -hmm. sure. so on? Thank you. For our condition, the dear share again, that and then so. Gazang あ、ちりかなディカザンウンジンディカンデシェコワレサラワゲ。ナンバーシェバセゲンデコチダンガザセベランシンデシロワゲ。セザンコーギガザンウンジンディカンデシェコガザンウンジンチェベトネタンナム
Sıra nasıl la de düşdü. Nam yedim zemi bu da. Nasıl acı var mı da yedim soğukta soyadı ki nam yedi kayıp da. O tez var. Uh, so I was trying to make sure that uh, I inform him your question clear so that we get as clear answer as possible. Um, so this is what Gisela, you know, um, uh, understood, uh, you know, asking about related thing, and his, his response is, um, for us ordinary uh, beings, um, our sense of I, there is I that exists, isn't it? And then there is I that doesn't exist. The two things are kind of muddled together. So we are not able to differentiate between the conventional I that exists and the I that is an object of negation doesn't exist. So they're kind of muddled together. And as a matter of fact, we will not be able to clearly differentiate between the two until we understand or realize what emptiness is. You know, so that's our uh, uh, challenge. And uh, so because of that, um, that you know, um, you know, we have this innately developed sense of uh, I, which is mixed with the conventional sense of I. Is it as if like we are really not particularly focused on any one of the aggregates, psychosomatic aggregates? It's just like we sit here and there's this kind of a sense of I, kind of very fixed entity. You know, it exists. Looks like it pervades all our uh, aggregates, but then it looks like it is something distinctive from that. And it has its own fixed entityness, you know, and that's what we have really figured out. But right? when we try to identify precisely the object of negation, you know, and just until we are able to figure that one out, you know, it's not so much like we are focused on uh, uh, aggregate of body or aggregate of consciousness, right, to sense <coughs> that. It's just kind of not even thinking about any of those aggregate. This sense of human, you know, uh, this kind of grasping at eye that pops up. And uh, some of the good moments for us to be able to take advantage of is when we are too excited and happy. Great things happen, you know. That strong sense of that I might pop up. Or when we are so scared and freaking out, you know, afraid, then that strong sense of I could pop up. So at such moment, if we can be very skillful and sort of a diplomatic, use another part of our mind to look at it, spy on it, then we might get a better sense of what it is. I mean, our mind can do multiple tasking here, you know. And, uh, and the example to that is Gejala said that if we are walking with uh, a stranger, right, together, and we are very suspicious of this stranger, is he going to do something bad to me, or whatever, right? So we are walking, but at the same time, our mind can do multitasking, is it? We are mindful of this person. Should he pull a rabbit out of the head or something? I'm, I'm going to be in it right here, right? So in the same way, when we such experience come up, we do the multitasking, you know, use a part of our mind called introspection to spy on it. But don't get too hard on yourself. Then we will slip, you know, that sense of I will disappear. We have to be very skillful how we spy on this sense of I, otherwise we are going to miss it, you know. And so that's what Kisha says. So it's uh, not like uh, we particularly think uh, that our aggregate of body is the I, that I, or the aggregate of consciousness is that I. The consciousness, you're right, in describing that it has no form, no shape, no color, everything. Uh, but not necessarily focusing on any of those things, we have that sense, you know. So I think we need to figure that one out before we can do the analysis of, right, uh, any of the aggregates existing, you know, that way or not. Okay. I know it did not answer, you know, directly your questions, but <laughs> somewhere relatedly. Any other, yeah. Uh, I'll go back to uh, Latmir or anybody. If not, yeah, could you give to back to? So, what is the difference between mistaken consciousness? It talk talks about uh, mistaken consciousness on page one. Page one. Each, uh, page one eighty one. One eighty one. Okay. Rough about the beginning. Does the conceptual consciousness is mistaken with yes, regard yes. to okay? Yes, yes. Uh, and then uh, later on, in the, on page 182, mm -hmm. the wrong consciousness. Wrong consciousness. Yeah. Uh, 182. Where do you see the wrong? It says wrong consciousness does not posit the role. Uh, the wrong, con oh, oh, it's in the last paragraph, right? Wrong yes. consciousness apprehends rope as a snake? Y yes, okay. yes. So, so what's the question you're going The, the question is, ask? is there a difference between mistaken consciousness uh -huh. and, and wrong consciousness? Uh -huh. And I understand that the... Oh, the, I have the, okay, yes, 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 yes. Um, I got it, yes. 
both conceptual and sensory cognitions are mistaken consciousnesses. Yes, 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 okay. But conceptual cognitions could be non-mistaken. Does that mean that they could be correct? Is the, uh, uh, the opposite of wrong consciousness? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, so what's the difference between mistaken consciousness, wrong consciousness, and yes, that one? Yes, and uh, then the next one is? Uh, well, th that's along the same line. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether the, the, the mistaken, um, the, the conceptual consciousness could be non-mistaken uh -huh. with regard, to, does that non-mistaken mean that it's a correct consciousness? Oh, I see non mistaken that's right, okay. Got, got, yeah. I think I'm very clear, so don't worry. Okay. Hopefully we'll get to answer. I think even I started to know what the Tibetan terms they might have translated this one, you know. It's good to know sometimes. So, I'm going to show you the again. Tagi, Anzo Dishev, Ruak, and Dam, Tokbe Sheva in a Ranganan, you'll trip rest, Ruak, and you will let a Chukumares, Ruak. Just a two years age, you know, again. That the net, the gay carasa, the tucked a two to the baggy loxes lab. Says on two years said a loxes sale, Keba Yari or Maristic Jaroga, Tanguchi Roga. The net did a yam dolia, Tobe Sheva de Nayula Tubere de in a Maju Shabbos lab. Ranjun, Pongol Maju, Sidicalada, <laughs> Melloy <laughs> What the <laughs> 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 Yes, there is, I mean, different. The Tibetan terms we use for the mistaken consciousness is chulba, right? Mistaken perceptions. The wrong consciousness, the Tibetan term is called lokshe, distorted consciousness, or wrong consciousness. Okay? Uh, so there's a you know, difference between the two. Um, now, in the case of uh, conceptual uh, perceptions, talk about, yes, they are mistaken with regard to the appearing object, Nangyul, but not necessarily to their uh, actual objects because they can be valid, <laughs> you know. Uh, but in general, we would consider um, uh, the conceptual cognitions among the mistaken perceptions. But in conventional sense, nobody says the, con the conceptual uh, perceptions are mistaken, right? Because we, you know, uh, because there is a valid, is it, I think this uh, goes back on, you know, how the Prasangika say that 
Perceptions can be mistaken, but they can also be a valid perception at the same time, see? So this is a complicated matter, right? That's what we're talking about there, okay? And then, of course, Geshe-la started to re-explain again uh, the difference uh, in terms of mistakenness between uh, non-conceptual sensory perceptions and conceptual cognitions, right? If a non-conceptual sensory perception is mistaken with regard to an object or aspect of object, it's mistaken in all respects. But in the case of conceptual perception, it doesn't. Because for the conceptual perception of, uh, let's say, a vase or a pot, right? I mean, most of you know that. I thought Gisela should explain that for the new years, right? Why do we say it is mistaken with regard to this appearing object is the generic image of the pot and the pot appeared as one, right, to that perception. So the generic image of the pot is not a pot, but it is kind of muddled together with the potness, you know, of thing, and therefore it is mistaken with regard to that appearing object, but it perceives the pot validly, you know. So that's the difference. Okay, I think Ishala is cueing me that we need to stop there today. Uh, by the way, today is a uh, very auspicious day. It's Buddhist Miracles Day. I don't know. We somehow <laughs> miss uh, observing this uh, day, as far as I remember. Um, so it's an auspicious day. Um, we'll do the Manjushri prayer in Tibetan and dedication in Tibetan followed by English. Um, Kangi Lodu, Jinye, Tinde, Ninda, Namda, Rose, Jinye, Tungu, Chichi, Sichi, Nidia, Toba, Lebam, Kanda, Sibet, Ram, Mari, Mendo, Dung, and Kit, Toda, Gunla, Puja, Taze, Yala, Ruju, Yang, then, so, Joda, Jero, Numon, Lady, Chadro, Jose, Maria, Muse, Dung, and Yuvo, Jinye, Jose, Radina, Dene, Taze, Saju, the Roy. Omarabazanandi Obeisance to my guru and protector Manjushri, who holds at his heart a scriptural text, symbolic of seeing all things as they are, whose intelligence shines forth as the sun, unclouded by delusions or terraces of ignorance, who teaches in sixty ways with the loving compassion of father for his only son, all creatures caught in the prison of samsara, confused in the darkness of their ignorance, overwhelmed by their suffering. You whose dragon thunder-like proclamation of dharma arouses us from the stupor of our delusions and free us from the iron chains of our karma, who wills this sort of wisdom, hewing down suffering wherever sprouts appear, clearing away the darkness of ignorance. You who have been pure from the beginning, who have completed the stages achieving the highest perfection of a bodhisattva, whose princely body is adorned with 112 marks of a Buddha, I bow down to you, Manjushri, Om Arapata Nadi, O compassionate one, with the brilliance of your wisdom, illuminate the darkness enclosing my mind, enlighten my intelligence and wisdom, so that I may gain insight into Buddha's words and the texts that explain them. Page 31. Like the sweet perfume of white lotus, born in the ocean of knowledge, nourishing honeybees, the fortunate being. Your fame pervades all directions. You are proficient and powerful in upholding the precious doctrine. To you, all of some tensing wonder, respectfully, I pray. Nhất tâm kính lễ Đức Văn Thù Sư Lợi, Đực Bại Trí, Ngài Điều Phục Hai Chướng Ngại, Tự Nhật Quan Lan Tỏa Khắp Mười Phương, Vật Thực Chứng Chân Nghĩa Màu Rốt Giáo, từ tim ngài bát nhã kinh thủ hộ nhiệm màu cõi luân hồi chúng sanh thọ nghiệp báo bị ngăn che bởi phiền não vô miên cùng đại bi 
Quý tử, tiếng rồng vang ngày thức tỉnh hữu tình, thoát khỏi vòng luân hồi nghiệp báo, gườm trí tuệ ngày chặt đứt vô minh, tận diệt muôn vàn khổ đau cùng ách nạn, trường tử như lai tối thắng toàn giác, ngài ăn trụ như thập địa pháp vân, báu thân ngài trang nghiêm thanh tịnh, 112 tướng hảo như lai, đây đầu đành lễ đức văn thù sư lợi, cúi xin ngài tận diệt ám chướng vô minh, Om Arapasanati, con khẩn cầu dưới lát sen bậc đại trí, ban pháp lực diệt phiền não vô minh, được trí sáng con thâm nhập nghĩa màu, pháp vi diệu cùng muôn vàn luận giải, như rượu hương ngọt ngào từ sen trắng. Nam mô Lúc Sang Tên Dinh Quang Đắc Xin Cung Kính Nghe Nhiều đồng 